Oh, praise God. Welcome, church. How are you doing today? Hallelujah. It's good to have you here today. Let's stand together this morning, shall we? Father, we invite your presence into this place because we need you, Holy Spirit. We need you to touch our lives. We're so thankful that we're not in this world alone, that we have a Holy One, a Comforter, who's come alongside. We thank you, Jesus, that you sent us the Holy Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit, come into this place, come into this very house and touch our lives. Let us know that you are here. We want to enter your grace and your mercy because great, great are you, Lord. Hallelujah. You give life. Love and light to the dark. Darkness, you, you give, give hope. hope. You restore, restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath. Shout. 
praise this morning. Awesome are you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days. Until I lay my head, oh, I, I will sing, sing of the goodness of God. And all my life, in all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every Of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in the dark. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Hallelujah. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you It's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. One more time, sing it now. Your goodness is running after. running after it's running after me with my life laid down i surrender now i give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me hallelujah in all my life you have All my life you have been so, so good 
with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, and all my life, you have been faithful. And all my Of the goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. God, you're, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. love that welcomes me.
that this morning to believe that he's good hallelujah amen thank you jesus you know i know there's people who struggle with that thinking that god is good because god doesn't grant them every wish that they want god doesn't pull them out of every situation they want to be pulled out of god doesn't heal them immediately when they want to be healed and so they don't think god is so good the fact of the matter is no one can be better than god that's right. Amen. Amen. My English is off, but nobody could be gooder than God. <laughs> it's impossible for that to happen. God is good. Why? Because of the way he loves us. He loves us better than we love ourselves. Amen. He loves us unconditionally, without merit, without favor. He just loves us for who we are, Amen. freely. He loves us. I don't know you, but that's pretty good. Amen. When you don't deserve love, He loves you. When you are unlovable, He still loves you. God is amazing the way He loves us. Is God good? 
He has to be good because nobody could love us the way he loves us unless he was that good. Yes, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Let's give another clap offering. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. So glad to have you in the house of the Lord. You may be seated. Welcome to Journey Church. If it's your first time here, if you haven't been here for a while, God bless you. We are glad that you're here with us today. We got a lot of people out traveling this weekend. I know that Justine and I were, were counting uh, on the way home last Sunday. I said, well, so-and-so said they weren't going to be here. Well, so-and-so said they weren't going to be here. Well, so-and-so said they were on their way to vacation. Well, so-and-so, this was happening. Like, Is there going to be anybody at church? Well, here we are. You're all here, right? And uh, yes, and most of all, God is here. Isn't that amazing? God is just so good. Appreciate your worship team this morning. I do. I have not had to drum for a long time because Mike usually does this. And uh, worship practice didn't seem to go horribly bad. But as soon as I sat down, the thing, the thing went crazy on me. Uh, my earplugs went, my earbuds wouldn't work. And then I hit one of those buttons that make everything just do weird things. Did you hear, did you hear, yeah, I apologize for that. Yeah, I could hear it. Yeah. And I couldn't, and I couldn't hear it until I finally got, I grabbed Mike's headset, and then it only was coming out of one side of the ear, but you know, God's good, isn't he? So, but you know, worship isn't about how well we play, it's about how much you love him. Isn't that true? That's really what it's about. So, good morning, God bless you. Well, listen. Uh, we've got a couple of things uh, happening coming up. Uh, one is kids camp. Now, I don't know if you've ever, if you ever were a kid and went to kids camp, uh, raise your hand. I know we have quite a few. Uh, kids camps are amazing. Uh, I never got to go to camp when I was a kid, but I went to camp as an adult, as a counselor with kids, and I saw the transformation that happened in these kids' life. Do they have fun? Mad camp is supposed to be fun. They had fun, they had a good time, but spiritually, oh my word, God was working. And everything we did at those camps was orchestrated for the glory of God to move and to touch these kids. And we saw kids filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw kids uh, called, to, called to missions. We saw kids called into the pastorate. Uh, we saw kids give their life to the Lord for the first time. I mean, man, does God get a hold of these kids at camp? And so I can't think of a better experience you could have but to have your kids go to camp uh, or your grandkids or whatever stage of life you're at to get them to go to camp. We believe it's vitally important because we've seen the difference it made not only in our lives but in the lives of our children and now in their children. And uh, we know that it's, it's a good thing. It's a great thing. So kids camp is coming up. And we have one week, uh, one weekend that's set aside. I think it's, uh, help me, Amy, if I'm wrong, but I think it's July 20, 22nd to the 25th. Yeah, those, those four days. Uh, now, kids' camp is, is wonderful. It's awesome. Your kids will come back energized for the, for the Spirit of the Lord. But uh, it doesn't come without a cost. Uh, camps are not inexpensive. It's about $200 on average for a week. So if you're cut it up into chunks, it's about $50 a day. That's for their food and transportation and everything that they get while they're there. So that can be difficult. If you have a couple of kids attending camp, that can be a lot of money uh, to some parents and some families. So what we're asking is that maybe some of you would be willing to help sponsor a child, maybe just for a day, maybe for a couple days. Maybe you can say, I'm going to give $50 to help pay one kid's day at camp. Uh, maybe you give $100, maybe you give $200, I'm just going to pay for a kid to go to camp and get a great experience with the Lord. Uh, whatever you can do, uh, we would appreciate, and all the families that are going to send children would deeply appreciate that as well. So we just want to encourage you to support a kid going to camp this year. Uh, in lieu of that, we're also going to be doing some fundraisers for the kids. Uh, next Sunday is Father's Day, they're going to have some snacks and drinks or whatever they're going to have out there for, so you can just purchase them and either hang out and eat them or take them with you, uh, but all those proceeds are going to go to, to the kids to help fund their camp program. So, 
If you have kids that are going to go to camp, it's really important that they see Amy. Would you raise your hand? That they see Amy today uh, because we need to get them registered as quickly as possible uh, because those spots fill up very quickly at our camps. And we want to make sure that we get these kids uh, on the roster so they can get there. So it's important that you see Amy and let her know. Even if you're not sure, if you're even thinking they're going to go, at least let her know so she's aware of uh, who's going to be going and what's going to be happening. So we appreciate that very much. Thank you. I think it's next Saturday. No. When is the next Saturday? Is Heart to Heart? Heart to Heart is meeting here at the church next Saturday, which will be the 19th. And they're going to have some food and things. They're going to meet at 9 o'clock. You go from 9 to about 1030 or so. And so, ladies, we encourage you to come and be part of that. It's always a good time to have fun food, fellowship, the word, encourage one another, pray for one another. So next Saturday, ladies, uh, that is your event. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Don't, don't just bring yourself. Bring a friend. Bring a neighbor. Bring a co-worker. Bring a family member. Bring somebody with you, right? That's the whole idea of what we do is make sure others can come along. And uh, we just don't do things for our church. We do things for the glory of God and for the kingdom, amen? We're going to be a little more kingdom-minded. Uh, lastly, I want to let you know that, uh, boy, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to play the drums today and still stand uh, this morning. I appreciate that. Um, just give you an update. I will be having surgery two weeks from tomorrow. So the 28th of June, which happens to be our 41st, 41st wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary to us. So... She'll probably be shopping for a new healthy guy at that point, but um, so that, that'll be our anniversary this year at Mayo in Rochester, and uh, so we'd appreciate your prayers uh, with that as well, but just to give you an update that that's what's going to be happening. So appreciative of the men and women who come alongside of me to help me uh, during those times, so I'm grateful for the other pastors here uh, in our church and for all that they do. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, we're going, to, uh, we're going to transfer over here to the, to the message. Before we do that, we're going, to play the, uh, we're going to play the video we didn't get to play last week. Well, the video worked, but the sound wasn't very cooperative. It was just music anyway, so just hum along in your head, I was going to think. I thought it was funny, though, that the music stopped about the time it got really, or the message got very important. You know, don't fit in, do not conform. Uh, you know, we, we talked about this last week. We just kind of got started. We got a little truncated because of the missionaries that were here, and, uh, and, and that was okay. Uh, but we wanted to talk about co being chameleons and not conforming to this world in which we live in. But yet we are here to do one thing, and that is we are to be imitators of Christ, right? Listen, you can't conform to the world and be an imitator of God. Do you get that? Have you read the news? Have you watched the news? Do you see the things that are happening around you? You can't be of the world and be of God. In fact, Jesus himself said that. He said, you can be in the world, but you can't be of the world. And that's what we're talking about, being 
chameleons. Because Paul instructs us in the book of Romans, he said, listen, do no longer conform. In other words, he says, you were. He says, no longer. He said, don't start it or don't even begin it. He says, no longer conform. In other words, he says, you've already started conforming to the things of the world. But I want you to quit doing it. Do not conform any longer. He says, don't blend in. Don't make the ways of the world your ways, right? Instead, we are to live as transformed people. Can I tell you something? This transformation that Paul's talking about doesn't just happen instantaneously. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's an intentional act of God's people not to blend into the world. The chameleon is a master of disguise. I mean, he just shows up, and whatever his surroundings are, he just blends in. Right? He just looks like everybody else. He acts like everybody else. He's this master of disguise. No matter what environment you put him in, no matter where you place him, right, it, it will change its color to disguise himself. Why? Because the chameleon's whole personality is to fit in. He wants to blend in. He wants to fit in. He doesn't want to stand out. But yet, if you under, we talked about this last week, you know that a chameleon has a true color. And its true color is kind of a whitish color, like a frosted glass. But we never see him that way because it always wants to blend in. It always wants to look like wherever it's at. So we never, ever get to see what it truly, really looks like. And yet that's a lot of times how God's people live. We don't, get to, they don't, we don't show our true colors. We just imitate everything else around us. I, I can't help but think to believe that people that either don't know God or are unsure of God that are not living comfortable in their I remember years ago there was a, a situation, there was something happening at the, at the high school, and this young man was talking about his lifestyle, and I just went up to him afterwards and I said, listen, I'm not here to, to you know, talk about who you are or what you do. I said, I only have one question I want to ask you. And I said, the, que- the question is this. Are you comfortable in the life that you're living? He just kind of stood there and looked at me, and he didn't have an answer. And I said, you've answered my question. Thank you. Because we just want to blend in. We want everybody to be okay with who we are and what we do. And the fact of the matter is we have been made in the image of God. And so I think anybody who's not living up to that image is living in a way that goes contradictory to the way they were made. We were made in the image of God. That's why I think for so long there was a hunger in my heart. I didn't even know what it was for. It's like there's got to be something. There's got to be something bigger. There's got to be something better. There's got to be something greater than what I know or understand because I'm always looking for something. I was always hungry for something. I always wanted more. I have the faster car or the, you know, the, the newer clothes. I, something. There was always something in me I had to have. Because I was made in the image of God, and what my soul was crying out for is you need to know who created you. Except it wasn't speaking those words, so in my confusion, I was looking for anything the world could give me to fulfill what only God, my creator, could fulfill in me. This personality of a chameleon is that they quickly pick up on those around them, and they become whatever they need to be, and we never get to see the true them. Matter of fact, Sometimes I think they're confused in who they really are. I don't think they know who they truly are. We'll talk about that in a minute. I think the, the truth is, as, as Christians, we are to stand out from the world. We should stand out against the backdrop of the world. We, should, we are called a peculiar people. Now, I don't want you to look weird. I don't want you to be weird. I just want you to be like God. I don't want you to dress, you know, because everybody says that, well, so pastor, you telling me I have to look weird, I have to act weird? No, I just want you to act like Christ. That's what it comes down to. Don't, don't dress up like you're still in the 50s. People would think you're weird, right? Don't get a haircut with mullets or whatever they used to wear. I mean, I don't worry about hair anymore, but, you know, right? We keep, we keep up, right? We're current in some of those respects, But in the same token, we're not supposed to blend in. We're supposed to stand out. Well, how do we stand out? We stand out in the way we act, the way we think, the way we believe, right? We'll talk more about that too in a moment as well. 
But listen, there's, there's something important about us having to stand out from the world because it gives recognition and not just to who we are but who God is in us. And that is so important. Grab your Bibles if you would. We're going to go to Romans 1 verse, Romans 12 2. We'll have it on the screen for you in just a moment as well. But let's pray over this word, shall we? Father, we love your word. It really is a precious commodity and a tool to our lives. And as Pastor Dave said this morning in crew, if they're not reading the word, they're truly not understanding what an amazing God we serve and love. And if they think the Bible is boring, they just need to read all of Scripture and find out, God, you are miraculous. And the things that you have coming in store, nobody in Hollywood could have ever produced. And so, Lord, we thank you today for your word. We pray it really is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It's living, it's active, it will not go void. And we believe today, Lord, if we just take your word and hide it in our hearts, not only will we not sin against you, we will be conformed into the image of your son. And we pray that that is the result we have today. May you be given the glory now as you anoint this word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Romans 12, 2, Paul says it very simply. He says, do not. Now, when somebody says do not, what does that mean? Don't. Now, if you talk to a two-year-old and you say do not, they don't even hear those words. Right? They don't hear them. But Paul says do not do what? Do not conform. What does that word conform mean? It means to assume a similar form. Right? It, it, it means to follow the same pattern. Paul says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, right? He says, do not assume a similar form of the world. Do not fall into the same patterns. <coughs> Excuse me. But he says, but, he says, there's something better I have for you. He says, I want you. isn't it great when somebody tells you what not to do, but then they tell you what to do? To me, that's always easier. If somebody says, don't do that, say, well, what am I supposed to do? Because if you don't tell me what to do, I'll probably do something else I'm not supposed to do too. So Paul said, well, listen, do not conform to the, but he says, but here's what, this is what you do. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's this transformation? It's a process that we go through, right, that we begin to, we begin to not look like who we used to be, but we begin to look more like Christ. We begin to look more like God. We start getting our mind, it starts in the mind. It says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Listen, as you, your mind is transformed, you're going to be guessing what the will of God is. But Paul says, listen, if you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. And we all need to know that. I can't tell you how many times people, <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, got you all awake now. People come to me and say, Pastor, how do I know God's will? How do I know the will of God? How do I know what God wants me to do? Get your mind transformed. Transform your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. To know what it is, to be transformed in the way he's thinking. The trouble is sometimes we don't know God's perfect will because we want our own will. We already have an idea of what we think God should do, and our minds are already made up. And we're not thinking and acting and responding the way God would want us to respond. So Paul's saying, listen, there's a contrast. There's a contrast between fitting in and standing out. And as Christians, we are called to be like who? We're called to be like Christ. Christians, Christ-like. We're supposed to be like Christ. So what does that mean? It means we act like Him. It means we look like Him. It means we think like Him. It means we interact with the world like Him him. If we say we're Christians, but we continue to live like everybody else, we're really hypocrites. And that's, isn't that what the world has against the church? We're just a bunch of hypocrites. Because you keep telling me one thing, but you do everything that I do. You act like me, you respond like me, but then you tell me that I need to go to church and be somebody different. But yet I don't see who this is I'm supposed to be looking like. Because we're hypocritical. There's a confronting that has to happen when we're in conforming. There has to be a confrontation because we conformed. And that's what Paul was saying. Listen, there's something coming for you. If you've conformed to the world and now you want to look like Christ, there's going to have to be a confrontation. A confrontation is going to have to happen. 
I wonder how many of you have ever tried to, to model somebody, that maybe somebody you looked up to or maybe somebody you admired, and you tried to act like them. You wanted to be like them. You did everything you could to act like them and, and to look like them and to talk like them and to sound like them because you were so infatuated with them. You wanted to literally be them. So you literally decided this is what you wanted to do. This was how I remember when my younger brothers were really young. They wanted to be Batman and Superman. And so all over the house, they would act like they were flying or kapowing people, right? They even had little cars that looked like the Batmobile. And, you know, they wore their outfits. Why? Because they wanted to be like Batman and Superman. So they, they did everything they could to imitate them and said they even believed that they were. They would be this tall, and they'd come up to me like, I'm going to, it's like, you're not going to do anything. I will slap you into next week. But in their minds, they were who they thought they wanted to be. And we do that. Even as adults, sometimes we see somebody, somebody say, oh, I wish I was them. Oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, I wish I could. I mean, I found years ago, I thought, oh, I wish I could preach like T.D. Jakes, or I wish I could, you know, really decipher the word like Charles Stanley. I wish I could really... And then God said one day, he says, but you're not Charles Stanley, and you're not T.D. Jakes. You're you. Just be you. Just teach the way you teach and preach the way you preach. Don't try to be somebody else. I didn't create you to be like them. I created you to be like me. So, this, so there has to be a confrontation. Sometimes I think we even like to try on other people's characteristics just to see if they fit us. Right? We just try them on. Well, I really kind of like... You're so outspoken and you're so bold and I'm just going to try that. But it's like a, a sweater that's got shrunken in the dryer. It doesn't really fit you anymore. Right? And you have to come to an idea that these patterns, he said, have, I mean, what happens when you don't like who you are because you've tried to be everybody else? There has to become a confrontation, right? There has to be this, this confrontation. Well, if we go to the, to the book of John and if you go to the first chapter of or John in John chapter 4, uh, we can see a divine confrontation that happened. Uh, Jesus has this encounter with the Samaritan woman. We all know the story pretty much, right? The, the Samaritan woman is, is a, a woman of ill repute. She's got a bad history. And uh, Jesus, of course, Jews and Samaritans don't get along with each other. They don't talk to each other. They don't hang out with each other. They hate each other. They don't even know why uh, because it just how they grew up, and they just hate each other, right? And so they just didn't want to be part of each other's lives. And yet, they would do everything in their power to avoid interactions with one another. Well, and the fact is that Jesus decided one day, he says, I'm going to travel through Samaria. And the disciples are like, what are you thinking? We don't, we're Jews. We don't connect with Samaritans. And Jesus says, well, I've got a plan. I'm going to Samaria. He said, I'm, I'm going to go there. Listen, Jesus wasn't so hung up on on cultural things, he had one thing in mind. He wanted to see humanity saved, right? The redemption of humanity was Jesus' things, not the protocol, the call. So Jesus intentionally, now this is important, Jesus intentionally went out to Samaria, right? And so he meets this woman, intentionally meets this woman at the well, She's going to draw water. It's about noon. Now, usually all the other women would come earlier in the day or they would come later in the evening. She didn't have any friends. The people of the community didn't like her because of her lifestyle. So she would come all by herself at noon. And Jesus just happens to show up. And what does the two of them do? There's a confrontation. Now, when you have a confrontation with Jesus, because he loves us so much, it isn't a heated argument. It's done with love and grace and mercy and compassion. But he has this interaction with this, with this woman who's ashamed of her lifestyle. She really would have not wanted to have this encounter with Jesus. Matter of fact, she said, why are you even talking to me? Why are we having a conversation? She was uncomfortable in this confrontation. And then Jesus, of course, makes her aware. He says, listen, your lifestyle is never going to truly fulfill the life that you want. What was he saying? You, you're a chameleon. You're living a lifestyle outside of what you should be living. As a matter of fact, he was very blunt with her. He says, the fact is you, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. 
Now, Jesus calls her out. He calls her out and says, listen, you're living in a way that's not offering you real life. He says, but what I'm going to offer you is a way to live a better life. So he calls her out. It's kind of what this sermon really is about, to call us out. To call us out and say, you conforming to the world? Are you blending into the world or are you standing out? Do people you work with, do people you live with, do your neighbors, do they know who you really are? Or do you just blend in? When you walk out of the door, when you walk into your workplace, when you walk into school, when you walk into your community, do people just see you, oh, you're just part of us? Or do they say, oh, I know them. They love the Lord. They're Christians. Right? They act a little bit different. They look like us, but they don't live like us. I mean, do people really know that? And Jesus was calling her out. And listen, this path to transformation has to come with a confrontation about our worldly patterns. Now, for this woman at the well, her transformation happened as she had an encounter with Jesus. Can I tell you something? Transformation is only going to come for us when we have an encounter with Jesus. You have to have an encounter with God. Have an encounter with him. Listen, this is what Jesus was willing to do. This was, I think, is so important. Jesus was willing to stand out rather than fit in for the sake of someone's soul. See, if Jesus just wanted to be the chameleon, he would have said, well, listen, Jews and Samaritans don't connect. We don't talk to each other. We don't have anything to do with each other. But Jesus says, you know what? I'm more willing to stand out rather than fit in because we're talking about somebody's soul. And for you and I, it's the same thing. We need to stand out for the sake of someone's soul. That's so important that we do that. Who do you know that doesn't know Jesus? You may be the one. You may be the one to introduce them to him. I wonder how many people look at your life and all they hear is the conflicts you maybe have with others. Or they hear about how you love Jesus and how you follow him, but they don't see much love coming out of your life toward other people. Listen, I believe one way or another, our lives paint an image in the heads of those who don't believe what God looks like, acts like, speaks like, and loves like. If we're truly the imitators of God that Paul calls us to be, then we are painting the picture of what God looks like in the minds of those who don't know God. The truth is, if we're going to stand out for Christ, then listen, I think one thing is imperative. Uh, one of the most important aspects of Jesus' ministry was love. If we're going to stand out for Christ, we have to love. I love what Pastor Choco, our general secretary for the Assemblies of God, just a, a few weeks ago at our, at our general treasurer, is he treasurer? Is he treasurer for the Assemblies of God? And he said to us, he says, he said, I lo we love this statement. He says, Love is, is heaven's currency. Love is heaven's currency. I love that. Think about what currency does. It provides, it supplies, it buys. It says this is what love, all, this is the currency of heaven is love. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, he says, therefore be imitators of who? Of God. It doesn't say be imitators of the world. Matter of fact, he already said, do not conform to the world. And he says, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in hatred. Because that's what most of the world I know lives in. That's where they walk in. Listen to the news. We ha people hate each other. They don't even know why they hate each other. It's like the Samaritan and Jews. They don't really know why they didn't like each other. Somebody just told them not to like each other. They said, okay, well, let's just live like that. But it says, therefore, as, as imitators of God, as his beloved children, walk in love. As Christ loved, as Christ loved us and gave up himself for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Paul says, be imitators of God. And he says, do that in the way you love. Do it in the way that you love. The reality is we, lo we, we distort God's love because we want to mold it into what the world defines as love, which is nowhere close to what God's working definition of love is. 
Listen, when Jesus was ministered on earth, he, he constantly was extending compassion, grace, mercy, and love to everybody he dealt with, even his enemies. Jesus loved those whom culture had denied unlovable, unclean, undeserving. This woman at the well, nobody else wanted to talk to her, but out of love, Jesus said, I will. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, nobody wanted anything to do with him. He took their money. Jesus walks into town and says, Zacchaeus, come down for me. I want to talk to you. I want to go to your house with you. They said, what kind of guy is this that he hangs out with publicans and sinners? It's a guy who loves. The woman with the issue of blood, the invalid at the, the pool of Bethesda, right? The, the thief hanging on the cross next to Jesus, right? The ones who hung Jesus to the cross. He treated them with love and compassion and grace. Just a Jesus to the outside world, even to his own disciples, looked crazy for talking to this Samaritan woman. And not only that, but the Pharisees thought he was crazy for healing people on the Sabbath. But listen, when you're going to love, when you're going to truly imitate God, if you're going to imitate the love of Christ, you're going to stand out. Jesus stood out. Why? Because he loved. He loved differently than the rest of the world. Listen, it's going to look odd to the world to love people the way Jesus loved them. The kicker is this. I, I believe this all in my heart. The unconditional, un unconventional love of Jesus produced unbelievable results. Read scriptures. Just read the Gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just go through those books. I mean, the unconditional and unconventional way Jesus loved had unbelievable, amazing results that could only come because of love, right? Guess what? If we imitate the love of God, we too will have unbelievable results. Why? Because we're going to stand out. We're not going to fit in with the way the world loves. We're going to stand out by the way that God loves. The question is this, are you willing to imitate Christ? And if you say, well, yeah, isn't that your whole... Isn't that your whole perspective? Isn't that what I'm supposed to be doing as a Christian? Yeah, you're supposed to be imitators of Christ. And to do that, you have to stand out and not fit in. And the greatest way of doing that is to love one another. Matter of fact, John said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus said it, John wrote it. By this people will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. Listen, loving others is such a shock to the world. People will know that you're a disciple of Christ. You will shock them into knowing you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. They'll say, who are you? How can you love like that? How can you treat people like that? Another way to look like this is this. If you love others, you're going to stand out. Pastor Choco de Jesus, I mentioned earlier, wrote a, wrote a book. We just got a copy of it. He, said, he titled it, Love Them Anyway. Love Them Anyway. That may be a new sermon series as I read more into the book, but I only read the part of the first chapter, and it's like I was already under conviction and already feeling the challenge to love like God. Love Him anyway. Love Him anyway. I mean, just the title of the book speaks a lot, doesn't it? Love them anyway. So this confrontation comes to this woman at the well, and we know what happens, right? We know the rest of the story. She finds out who she really is in Christ. She's forgiven and set free. And all of her community knows she is no longer the woman she used to be. Because she had an encounter with Christ. And when people see us, they say, you're not who you used to be, are you? Nope, I had an encounter with Christ. And now the real me is coming out. In John 5, 1 to 9, Jesus meets this man who's been an invalid for 38 years. And uh, he's laying at the pool of, of Bethesda, and he's laying there, and he's been there for, for 38 years. And Jesus confronts him. We think, well, Jesus should have compassion, but before Jesus has compassion, sometimes there's a confrontation. He said, let me, let me confront you, and then I'll show you my grace and my love. But there's a confrontation. And he walks up to the guy, and he says, Jesus saw him lying there, and he realized that he had spent a long time in that condition and so Jesus asks him a question that we sometimes think is a crazy question. Jesus says, do you want to get well? Well, if I was an invalid for 38 years, 
that would seem like a foolish question. But this is why it's so important that Jesus asked the question. It's the reason why we tell people, hey, if you want to get constant, if you want to get, if you want to take up some of our time, if you want us to pour into your life, you need to initiate to let us know that you want to get well. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was asking the question. Jesus, I can get you well. I can fix you. I can do a miracle. But the question is, do you want what I have to give you? Do you want to get well? I mean, Jesus was looking at a man who was full, who he had, remember we said, be transformed by the renewing of his mind, of your mind. Jesus was looking at a man whose mind was so conformed into thinking that this was the way his life was always going to be. He said, this is it. Matter of fact, we see that by the response to the question. This is his reply. He says, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am on my way, someone else goes in before me. What happened? His mind said to him, it's never going to happen. You're never going to get there. Somebody's always going to beat you to it, right? This is going to be your lot in life. He was only able to respond out of the reality he believed he occupied. I would argue this. I would argue that his condition, his suffering, his, his discouragement had conformed his, his thinking to a mindset of hopelessness. It's never going to happen for me. It's not gonna happen. This is my life. This, I'm hopeless. There's nothing that's going to happen. Talked about this last week. You know that on average day you have 60,000 thoughts? Every day you have an average of 60,000 thoughts. And some of you are going, my brain doesn't work that well. <laughs> but there's a, a clinic in Cleveland who, who, did this, who did this research and it said this. You have 60,000 thoughts a day, but 80% of them are are negative. 80% of those thoughts you have are negative. Houston, we have a problem, right? Then I call it stinking thinking, right? Proverbs wrote this, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's what was happening to this man, this, this invalid. 38 years, he said, well, this is, my, this is who I am. This is all that it's going to be, right? He said, I can't be who I truly was created to be because his mind had already told him and conformed to the image of the world that said, this is all I get. And so Jesus had to have a confrontation with him and said, listen, the battle is won and lost in the mind. That's why he asked the question, do you want to get well? And the question was, well, I don't think I can get well. Listen, with Jesus, all things are possible, amen? I know what's your experience in life. I don't know what confrontation you need to have with God. But I can tell you this, there is no stronghold in your life greater than Jesus. There is no sin so strong that he can't help you break it. Right? There's no enemy out to get you that Jesus can't defend against. Right? Listen, we just get conformed to the world and think, well, this is it. And we buy into the things of the world to think we have to conform into the world because if I want to be happy, i got to be worldly. And God says, and Peter's saying, listen, if you want to be happy, you need to be godly. So a confrontation has to happen. Listen, so much of the world is inviting us to conform to the world. Watch the commercials. So much of the world is inviting us to conform to the world. So easy to conform to the world. But can I tell you something? The world falls way short of the glory of God. And what does it tell us, Corinthians? Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. It doesn't say whatever you do, do for the glory of the world. It says whatever you do, do for the glory of God. The world conforms, but the word transforms, amen? And we're supposed to be people of transformation. And sometimes I think if we try to figure out these patterns in our life, maybe some of these negative patterns in our life, and we're trying to figure out why life seems to be uh, seems to be going in the ways of the world, and I think sometimes it's a correlation between how much time we spend with God and how much time we spend in the world. This may date me, but I remember guys like Rich Little. The old people said, yeah. Rich Little was an imitator. Amazing. 
I mean, just in a, it, just like that, he could become John Wayne. Two seconds later, he becomes President somebody. He just, President Nixon. I mean, just, and this is what imitators do. And he, he, did a, he did a talk show one time, and they asked Rich about what he did. And he said, I just study these guys. He said, I study their manners. I study their speech. I study their actions. He said, I just study him. And he says, then I just imitate them. I'll change my voice, right? To him, we look and say, well, Rich Little was a chameleon. He looked at everybody else and wanted to be them, so he responded to them, right? But the fact of the matter is Rich Little was still Rich Little. And he said, I don't want you to think I'm them, I'm me. I just have studied them enough that I can act like them and you think I'm them. And isn't that the way it's supposed to be for us? I mean, the world wants us to look like the world. We study the world. We spend a lot of time in the world. And so it's easy for us to conform to the world. But I think if we would spend a lot of time with God and more time in His Word than what we have been and more time in prayer, right, I would think it would be easier for us to become imitators of God. Like Rich Little, he says, you need to study Him. I want you to study God. Study the way he acts. Study the way he thinks. God says, if you really want to know my thoughts and my actions, look at my son Jesus. I put him on earth so you can see me. So he says, look at Jesus and you will see me. Even Jesus says, when you see me, you see the Father. This is how the Father acts. This is how he loves. This is how he thinks. This is how he responds. This is where he goes, right? He's not so tied up in the culture. He doesn't tie it up in the things of the world. He's tied up in the things of the kingdom. Jesus is more kingdom-minded than anybody I know. Everything was in relationship to the kingdom. He goes, oh, the world's going to mess you up. He says, you're going to have trouble in this world. Jesus never had a whole lot of good things to say about the world. We had a lot of amazing things to say about heaven and about his Father. And for us, if we're going to look like God, I think we have to spend more time with him and when we do that, we'll begin to look more like Jesus than we've ever had before. And that's why Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, we are in need of a spiritual and mental renewal. Isn't that true? It doesn't just happen in the spirit. It happens in your mind. There's a renewal that comes there as well. But listen, all these things be renewed by your renewing of your mind, being transformed, not conforming to the world Listen, these things are not easy, but I tell you, they're more than worth it. They are more than worth it. You don't have to look far to discover how to fit in and be like everybody else. It's easy to act like everybody else. However, when you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, your true color should now be that of His, and you should be transformed into His image. Isn't that the desire? Don't, Don't see me. I hope you see Jesus. Listen, we have to remember as Christians who we represent. You don't represent you. You don't represent the great hero on the baseball field or the football field. You don't represent the government standout. You don't represent the woman on the front of the cover of whatever magazine she's on. You don't represent... Hollywood, you don't represent the people in the movies, right? We want to act like them, right? You don't represent those. You represent one person as a Christian, and that's God the Father. That's who you represent. I need you to remember who you represent. And then I need you to remember that the power of the kingdom is on your side, right? The power of the kingdom of God is behind you to encourage you and to help you. Listen, you need to stand out rather than fit in. The video is true. It says we are chameleons because we just want to blend in. I'm grateful that Jesus never blended in, but he stood out, and that's the way it is for you and I. Listen, there's one thing, and Paul says it too. He says, more of Christ, less of me. I think that should be the motto over all of our lives as Christians. Less of me and more of Christ. Again, we go back to that Casting Crown song. It says, I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. 
Isn't that true? I love that song. It's like, I don't care. I don't care if they remember me. All I care about when they think of me, they think of Jesus. But that's only going to happen one way, church. And the only way that can happen is we can no longer be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewings of our mind. Amen? I tell you, it's a good thing. Not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You think, well, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be weird. I'm not asking you to stand. Jesus wasn't weird. Jesus wore the same clothes as everybody else. Jesus told jokes. Jesus got snippy sometimes. Right? Jesus was human in the flesh, right? He got hungry. He said the same thing you and I, but, but what did he do? He said, I can't be anybody but who I am, and I am the Son of God. And we have to get to a point to say, I can't be anybody else but who I am. We are children of the Most High, and we are to reflect our Father, amen? And I'll tell you that the biggest challenge and wanting to do that is the way you love. And I want to challenge you to love one another the way God loves us so that the world will know that we are His disciples. Amen? And when somebody says to you, why do you treat those persons? You know, what, how, come, how come you're friends with the person nobody else wanted to be friends with? Because I want to act like Christ. How can you stand the person that nobody else can stand because I just want to be Christ to them. Listen, when you love like God loves, you will stand out, amen? But it'll be a good thing. It'll be an amazing thing. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Well, Heavenly Father, we are chameleons. The problem is we're chameleons for the wrong reason. We're chameleons because we have blended into the world. We look like the world. We act like the world. We think like the world. We love the world. But we also tell you that we love you and that we follow you. Lord, we need to quit riding the fence and make a decision. Are we on the world side or are we on your side? Are we going to imitate the world or are we going to imitate you? Are we going to follow the world or are we going to follow you? Are we going to love like the world or are we going to love like you? Are we going to blend in or are we going to stand out? And I believe that's the questions you're challenging us with today. Lord, I pray in my heart of heart that we already know what we're supposed to be doing. And I know, Holy Spirit, you've been speaking and you've been challenging those hearing this message about the way we live. And then how much do people see us of the world and yet don't see anything about Christ in us, and yet we are His. Lord, would you help us to be chameleons for Jesus, that we look like Him, and we don't let anything around us change that. We act like Him, and we don't let anybody around us change that. We love like Him, and we don't let the words of the world determine how we love. Well, there may be some in the room this morning that are hearing the message and saying, well, I, I want to look like Christ and be like Christ, but I don't really know him that well. Then I would encourage you to get to know him, and it begins in a personal relationship. Jesus has been waiting for you. He's been waiting for this moment for you to say, Jesus, I want to be a part of your life, and I need you to be a part of mine, and I'm going to invite you to come in. Being part of a church isn't being a part of a church because you're with everybody else. You're part of a church because you've already made a connection with Jesus. And I would encourage you to make the connection. Talk to him. Pray to him. If you're under, if you're under conviction, ask him to forgive you of your sins. Say, Jesus, I don't like the life I've been living. I don't like who I've become. I don't like the results. I don't like the prophets that I'm reaping because of the way I live. I can't find peace. I can't find happiness. I can't find joy. I keep looking. I keep searching. But it seems to always elude me. And open your heart to him. 
Say, Jesus, come into my life. Come in in a personal way. Be, be Lord and Savior of my life. Come in. Come in in such a way that I listen to you, that I respond to you, that I hear from you. I live like you. So my days would be fulfilled with, with ways I've never imagined they could be. Simply ask him, Jesus, forgive me, come into my life. Make me new, and I, I determine and commit to follow you all the days of my life. Simply pray that prayer. And the word says, when you do, you will be a new creation, a new person. You will have a new life, a new hope, a new future. And for us of, uh, who have already made that commitment and you are finding that you're more of the world is in you than that of God, I would encourage you, it's time to have a confrontation with Jesus and change things. So there can be less of the world in you and more of God. And if you're struggling to do that, spend more time with Him so you can be an imitator of His. But I believe, Lord, in these last days that the you're going to tail the veil off of the church. And there are going to be some churches who are not going to reveal your glory. They're going to reveal the things of the world because they've allowed the world to come in. But I thank you for the churches, Lord, when the veil is torn off, they're going to reveal the glory of God because they've been imitators of yours. Not listening to what the world says is okay, but listening to what you said is okay. And I pray, Lord, that we will always be one of those churches that reveal the glory of God because we refuse to conform to the world, but we desire to be imitators of you. So, God, thank you for this challenge. I pray simply as your son taught us to pray that your will be done in his name. Amen? Amen. 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 What a challenge, huh? It's a great challenge for us to be conformed to the image of God. But God can do all things, amen? Don't get yourself into a mindset like the, like the invalid who said, there's no hope for me. There's always hope for you. It's amazing to me how many people come to me and say, oh, Pastor, God can't change me. I'm so bad. I say, but God is so good. He can change the hardest of hearts. God can take somebody who killed his own people and create in him one of the most important men of God the world had ever known. God can and God will, amen. Never get yourself to a mindset to think that you can't be transformed because God can, amen. Would you stand with me? I want to pray a blessing over you as we let you go. Enjoy this beautiful day, amen. Well, remember, when you leave this place, don't blend in. Stand out. But stand out for all the right reasons. Would you raise your hands receive a blessing from the Lord? Listen, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he grant you his presence like a coat around you. And may his peace be with you. May he love you like you've never been loved before. And when you are embellished by his love, I pray not only would you receive it, but you would distribute it to those around, distribute it to those around you. I pray God would meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory. And I pray that God would use you as his ambassador to a world who needs to know what true love looks like. And I pray that God would bless you in your coming and your going that he would open doors of opportunity to you to show the world what an amazing God you serve and follow. As God pours out his love and his blessings over your life, I pray that you would always and forever be grateful, not just for the moment, not just for, for the day, but for all of eternity. And all who received from the Lord this morning said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day in the Lord. Uh, we will plan on seeing you next Sunday for Father's Day. Uh, we're going to have a, a special challenge for the men, but a special gift for them as well. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Amen. So we'll see you, fathers, next week. God bless you.
Oh, we didn't make an announcement over the offering, uh, but you know the drill.